Alrighty guys, so I'm back and I must apologize again. I know that I had said a while ago that I would make my vocab videos like the next weekend and I didn't and truthfully I just get very busy but I also didn't necessarily know how to make these videos. What was the best way to go about doing it? It had been a while since I had like studied this vocab so I just spent some time going through and kind of familiarizing myself with the terms again, I made a little cheat sheet for myself. Um, and then I also want to go through and show you why I use Quizlet. And um, I'll back up and kind of do a little intro. So my name is Sarah Smith. I do have a eight part pass your life insurance exam on the first try video series that you can go and watch on my channel. And in each one of the descriptions for those videos, I have the link to my Quizlet that I created probably like two years ago now. I love Quizlet. I've been using Quizlet since college. Quizlet has helped me pass exams in college. It helped me pass menu tests back when I was a waitress, helped me to pass my real estate exam. It helped me to pass my insurance exam and has helped a bunch of people that used to take my class when I would physically teach my class. But now that I am too busy and I cannot do that anymore, that's why I decided to make those videos. And I linked my Quizlet in um, the description box so that people could go and use it. And I'm happy to say that y'all do because I get a lot of emails from Quizlet all the time saying like, two week streak. Um, you know, you've been doing this for a couple of days now. So that makes me feel good knowing that y'all are using it because that's what it's there for. So I'm going to, in this video, because this is video number one of my two that I'll do for vocab. They're going to be on the longer side, but just, I'm hoping that with these two vocab videos, along with the eight part series of just questions. And then the last thing I need to do is those additional questions that I found in my binder that I had, I will make those videos hopefully like next weekend. Um, I'm hoping that my channel will be your kind of like one-stop shop to be able to pass your life insurance exam. As I've given my disclaimer in my eight part series videos, I'm in California, so I took the California exam. So my questions in those videos, a lot of times will say in the state of California, if you've been studying this for a while, you know that insurance is governed by the states. It's not governed by the federal government. So you have state specific laws that you should be studying before you go in to take this exam. Especially if you're in North Carolina, you need to study your state laws. So I would always say, if you are not in California, ignore those questions. Well, what I also would say is when you are starting to study for something like life insurance, you have vocab terms. And just like when you're studying for a language that you don't know, you need to study your vocab. That's how this is. You are learning a foreign language and you have to start with your vocab. Once you nail your vocab terms and you know what key terms and what key phrases you're looking for in the questions that you're asked on the exam, those questions will start to answer themselves because you are so proficient in your vocab knowledge. That is what these videos are for is, of course, you have access to the Quizlet so you can guide yourself through the Quizlet, but these videos are meant to be a guided tour through the vocab Quizlet that I created, and I will do my best to go in depth, give you guys real life examples, and even clarify points that I think that people have usually had issues with. I will do my best to make this as easy to understand as possible. That way y'all can pass your life insurance exam on the first try. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm going to show you guys why I love Quizlet so much. I say it all the time, people have different styles of learning. I'm an auditory, I have a degree in theater, I'm an actress, that's why I moved to California. Don't ask me how I ended up in finance. Um, but I'm an auditory learner. So when I needed to learn my lines, I would record myself saying my lines because I learned by hearing the inflection in my voice. So if you're an auditory learner, that's why I made these videos so that you could just listen to them while you're driving or getting ready in the morning or getting ready for bed. So you can just hear me ask the question and answer the question. If you need to quiz yourself, that's why I like Quizlet. There's many different ways that you can use 
Quizlet to quiz yourself, which I'm going to show y'all right now. Okay, you should be able to see my screen. Now, this is my Quizlet. If you go to and you click the link in the description box for this video or any of my other videos, it will pull up this. It's 144 terms. As I mentioned, I literally went into Excel because that's what I use for myself and my team to study for this exam. I went to uh, Excel and I said every single term that I could find in every single chapter I put into this Quizlet. So I'm making two videos, 72 questions or 72 terms each. It's going to be long, two videos, but like I said, bear with me. Go on to Quizlet, hit test, and you can set up your test. So let's just start with 60. You can change it to do however many terms you want. Answer with the term definition, pick one. You can do true, false, multiple choice, matching. I don't ever do written because you have to spell it exactly right. And that's a little bit challenging. So, all right, this is of 60 terms. So a risk that presents the chance of loss, but no opportunity for gain. gain. This is insurable. Is that a speculative risk? Nope. That's a pure risk. So true or false. And if we scroll down. Now we can see where you're choosing the best option. States that the effective date of policy is the date of receipt of the initial premium. Should the applicant die before it is fully processed, the benefits are fully payable and will pay this or not. Will pay this whether or not they would have been approved. Um, binding receipts. And then if you go all the way down, you have matching. So this is click a term to match it with a definition, a method of determining how much life insurance you need based on funds your family would require to maintain their lifestyle after your death. You come down here, needs approach, and so on. So this is why I love Quizlet because there's all these fun ways to quiz yourself and ways to learn. So you can essentially use this to like take the exam before you take the exam. You guys have the ability to create your own Quizlet as well. So if you want to create a Quizlet using your own state specific laws, you're more than welcome to do so. Obviously you can do whatever you want, but this is mine that I created for literally all of you to be able to come in and just learn your vocab terms. So that's what I think is super fun about Quizlet. So let's get into it. I knew that was going to happen. Please hold while I go back to number one. Okay. All right. We're back at number one, as y'all can see. Okay. So reserves. Funds held by an insurance company to help fulfill future claims. This is where uh, rating service companies come into play, like an AM Best, Standard & Poor's, Moody's. Those rating service companies rate the insurance companies based on their ability to pay out future claims, right? So how strong their reserves are will dictate how strong their rating is because it's whether or not they're able to fulfill their obligation to their insureds. Stock company, insurance companies owned and controlled by a group of stockholders, stock company. Non-participating plan. I talk about this in these non-participating plans and participating plans in the eight-part series. I even draw out for you what a participating plan looks like when it pays out. But a non-participating plan is a plan in which the insured is not entitled to share in the divisible surplus of the company. And we know that divisible surplus is called dividends. A mutual company is a company that is owned by its policy owners and usually issues participating insurance. 
So Mutual Company is owned by me. I'm a policy owner. And typically, it will issue me a participating insurance policy. That means that I do have the right to share in the company's divisible surplus. And I do have the right to dividends. Participating plan. This is what I drew out um, on my whiteboard in one of my past videos. I don't remember which one, sorry. But I'll go a little bit more in depth for you guys here and what that means to be able to share in the divisible surplus. So this is a plan in which policy owners receive shares of the company's divisible surplus by way of dividends, right? So what that means is if you have a mutual insurance company owned by the policy holders, let's say it makes $100 million in 2022. January 1st of 2023, they say, okay, we made $100 million. The liabilities that we had to pay out last year equated to 90 million, which means we have a $10 million surplus above our liabilities, right? So the surplus is now divisible amongst all of the policy owners because they're owners of this company. So let's say, I, I don't know how many there are, but let's say every policy owner's share of that divisible surplus is $50. So me as a policy owner, I received $50 of dividends, which was my share of the company's $10 million surplus, right? That's where I have options. My dividend options will come in. I can say with my $50, I want to subtract it from what I owe in premium annually. So let's say I owe $350 in premium annually. I'll say, okay, I'm gonna put my $50 towards my annual premium. Now I only owe 30 or $300 for the rest of the year. I can say, oh, I have this you know, extra $50. Hey, insurance company, how much more insurance can I get if I'm paying $350 now to have annually to have $250,000 of coverage. If I have this $50 to put towards that $350, how much more insurance can that buy me? Okay, I'm going to do that. Now I have, you know, $300,000 of coverage because I put an extra $50 towards it. You have options with what you can do. Last bit that I will say in regards to participating plans that pay out these dividends. Do you think these dividends are taxable? Do, 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 do. Are they taxable? The answer is no. Those dividends are not taxable because they are seen as a return of premium. You've already paid the company, right? It was a surplus. The company didn't need it to pay out its liabilities, so they see it as a return of premium to you, so it's not taxable as income because it's money you already paid. They're giving it back. That's important to know. That question will more often than not show up on your exam. Reinsurer. A company that provides financial protection to insurance companies. They handle risks too large for the insurance company to handle on its own. This is where I usually use my two phones to explain this or anyone that has an uh, understanding of how the mortgage industry works, where they'll sell off mortgages to basically like a reinsurer. So let's say National Life Group writes a $10 million policy. They're tying up $10 million of assets. That's a lot, right? So then the reinsurance company comes along and says, we'll buy that off of you. We're going to take that $10 million of liability off your plate. That way you have $10 million you can free up to go and write more insurance policies. Reinsurance. If this company that's doing the reinsuring only exists to reinsure this company what is this company called? If you've seen my eight-part series, you probably know the answer to this. This company is called a captive insurer. Important to know. This concept will end up on your exam. Fair Credit Reporting Act. 
a federal law that established procedures that consumer reporting agencies must follow in order to ensure that records are confidential, accurate, relevant, and properly used. Um, one thing that I will say about this is from being in the industry, I know that when I put in applications, more often than not, they will say, if there's a consumer report, do you want to receive it? I said yes, because I wanted to know what they had on me. <laughs> like, I want to know what the government knows. I want to know what like LexisNexis is finding when they're doing my underwriting. I want to know. So it's pretty cool. This Fair Credit Reporting Act, you have access to things like your credit score and your consumer report to know basically what these companies are finding when they run a search on you. Policy summary. A summary of the terms of the insurance policy, including conditions, coverage limitations, and premiums. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's literally like a one or two page summary of who's the insured, who's the owner, who's the beneficiary, how much you know, coverage do you have? What is your annual premium? What do you pay monthly? Yada, yada, yada. It's just a summary of what your policy entails. Life insurance. Insurance against loss due to the death of a specific person, the insured, upon whose death the insurance company agrees to pay a stated sum to the beneficiary. Sorry, guys, in my typical fashion, it's like 11 o'clock at night, so I might yawn. Um, yeah, it's just um, making sure that your family can go on after your death when they lose your income. Life insurance. Term insurance. Life insurance coverage for a specified period of time. It expires without value if the insured survives the stated period designed to provide temporary protection in case a person dies during a specified period of time. So if you're not super familiar with the industry, you might be saying, oh, what's the point of this thing that's gonna go away at some point if I outlive it with no benefit whatsoever, no residual benefit, no value at all. There's plenty of reasons that we use term insurance. One, it's much less expensive than a whole life or universal life policy. Um, let's say you buy a house and you have a mortgage term of 30 years. It's really beneficial to have a term policy that can pay off your house in event of your in the event of your untimely death. That's how you say that. That way your family doesn't lose your income and then be kicked out of the house because they can't afford it. Um, it's really beneficial in what we call laddering. Laddering is where we use term and whole life together or universal life together. That way we can get the family, you know, the 1.2 million of coverage that they need without having to pay a thousand dollars a month for it. Like you would if you use only whole or universal. So when that coverage, that term coverage expires after 30 years or 15 years or 10 years, whenever the period is for, they still have something left over in whole life, but we keep the costs down. So there's a lot of benefits to having term insurance, even though it expires at some point. And something like 97% of term policies never pay out, which I think is crazy. But that's how companies are able to pay out these insurance claims when they do need to, right? Because not everybody uses their insurance policy. Whole life insurance. Permanent level insurance protection for a person's whole of life, characterized by level premiums, level death benefits, and cash values. If you watched my eight-part series, you know that I always talk about key phrases, key terms, keywords that make the light bulb go off in your head, right? So we know whole life insurance our light bulb is the word level. Level premium, level death benefit equals whole life. Flexible premium, flexible death benefit, universal life. Choose where cash value can be invested or choose investment that provides a greatest return, variable life. Key phrases. 
like I said, once you know your keywords, your key phrases, these questions start to answer themselves. So whole life, level premium, level death benefit. Group life insurance. Now this is where, and I hope y'all, I hope I'm like big enough in the corner that y'all can see it, but this is where I make my octopus to explain group life insurance. So it's life insurance that provides a master policy for a group. Typically it's through your work, right? So it's your employer's insurance. The employer pays for this group policy. They get a master policy. Each eligible group member receives a certificate of insurance. That's where I give my little tentacles. So your master policy and then all your little tentacles for each of the employees down here. And each employee, right, member of this group policy receives a certificate of insurance. And that's how that works. Consideration. Part of an insurance contract that sets forth the amount of the initial and renewal premiums, and the frequency of future payments. Now, consideration is extremely important when we're talking about contracts or life insurance, real estate, whatever in general. So consideration just means that something of value is being exchanged. So consideration does not necessarily have to mean money. In real estate, it is quite possible to sell a house for love and affection. Love and affection is something of value being exchanged it counts as consideration. In the case of life insurance, your consideration is your premium, right? It's the thing of value that you're exchanging for your insurance coverage. So consideration clause is, this is just consideration, but consideration clause is the part of the contract that states, this is how much you have to pay every month or every quarter, every year, whatever you pick for the coverage that we're giving you. And like I said, when, right? So the amount and the frequency of the payments, that's your consideration. Disability insurance, a type of insurance that ensures the insured's earned income against the risk that a disability renders the insured unable to complete the core functions of their work. So you get a disability policy in advance, hoping that nothing ever happens to you, but planning for the worst saying that if you become disabled at some point in the future and you cannot work, you cannot earn an income, this insurance policy will pay you to replace your income if you can't work. Entire contract provision states that the policy document, the application, which is attached to the policy, and any attached riders constitute the entire contract. Okay, so when you have clients and you sit down with them and you put in an application for insurance, you say, da -da 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 -da. this is everything about them. This is how much coverage they want. This is how much we ran the illustration we think it's going to cost for them to have this amount of insurance, right? So you put in the application and it goes through underwriting and then the company comes back and says, this is our offer. You put the policy in force and then you receive a policy packet as the client, right? So the entire contract provision is just basically stating what constitutes this policy that they're going to receive. Because that policy is a contract because it meets our four contract requirements that we'll get to later. These are the things that constitute that entire contract that make up that entire policy. Your application will always be inside of that policy packet that you receive. I'm not 100% positive, but I'm pretty sure that the logic behind that is your incontestable period. If something happens within your two-year incontestable period that maybe had been concealed and the company just didn't find out about, they can go back and say, we're going to look at the application and what you said, all of those uh, representations that you made to us. And if we find out that within this application, you did not reveal to us this condition that you have that's now come about, if it's something that existed, of course, they will not pay out your policy. So that's why I believe that the application is a piece of the entire contract because of your incontestable period and them 
needing the ability to go back and see what representations were made at the time of application. But I digress. Notice of claim describes the policy owner's obligation to provide notification of loss to the insurer within a reasonable amount of time. In the case of life insurance, that just means when somebody passes away, or if you're using living benefits, has some sort of um, insurable event, right? You notify the company within a reasonable amount of time. That's just notice of claim, right? You say, hey, insurance company, uh, my mother passed away. I'm going to be sending you the death certificate and I'd like my payment furnished, basically. Reinstatement. Act of putting a lapsed policy back in force by producing satisfactory evidence of insurability and paying any past due premiums. Now, there's two different aspects of a policy uh, of somebody maybe not being able to pay for a policy, two different aspects, right? So one, apologize, is reinstatement. And one is your grace period, right? So grace period is I haven't paid, but my policy hasn't lapsed because I'm still within my grace period. So I still have the ability to go and make that up and pay that. Now reinstatement, which is what we're talking about, the policy has already lapsed. I want to put it back in force. Because it's already lapsed, I have to prove evidence of insurability. Basically, that's the insurance company saying you couldn't pay or you weren't willing to pay. Now you want to pay again. I want to make sure that the reason that you're coming back to put your policy back in force isn't that there's some condition that's now come about that would render you uninsurable and that's why you want your insurance back but you just didn't want to pay for a while right so you have to issue um, a good health statement to them saying that nothing has changed in your health since the policy lapsed and that's not why you want to put it back in force and then you have to pay any past due premiums and then it's back in force peril Okay, now this is what I needed my cheat sheet for because I filmed this video before this and then I got to like these next couple ones and was just talking in a circle and couldn't get my thoughts straight. So I wrote everything out and I hope this will help me get through these next couple ones. So peril. Peril is the immediate specific event causing loss and giving rise to risk. Loss is the loss of assets resulting from a pure risk. Now we know, and these will show up later, but I'm going to talk about it now. We know there's two types of risk, pure and speculative. Pure, your options are loss or no loss. Speculative, your options are gain or loss. This is like a car accident. Either I'm going to get into one or I'm not. And this is like gambling. Either I'm going to win money or I'm going to lose money. So a loss is the loss of assets resulting from a pure risk. Example, car insurance, car accident, I'm sorry. You would lose the car functionality or you would lose the car if it's totaled resulting from the car accident that is the pure risk, right? So that's loss. Hazard. Any factor that gives rise to a peril. Um, and then risk, and then I'll go back. The probability of loss occurring for an insured or prospect. Okay, so I wrote down these four because they are um, something that gives me issues whenever I talk about it. Like I understand them enough to be able to get the question right. But um, I do realize that this is, or I noticed when I was teaching my class that this was something that people would kind of be like, what's the difference? You know, why is this one hazard, but this one is risk and you know, why? So I wrote down those four. So we are gonna go through risk, hazard, loss, and peril. And my example for you is when you're driving, on the road and you have ways 
or your maps open. If there's a car accident ahead of you or someone's tire came off and it's in the road or like an oil spill or fire, whatever, if there's something in the road in front of you, what does your maps or your ways say? Hazard reported ahead, right? For this example, I'm going to use that there is a car accident where two cars collided on the highway in front of you, but you can't see it yet. But you have your maps on and it says hazard reported ahead. So we know there's a car accident involving two cars in the highway ahead of you. Okay, that's our example. So peril is the accident ahead. The immediate specific event. It's the fact that two cars collided with each other. That caused a loss, right, of those two cars, and it's giving rise to additional risk. Now, the loss is the car, right? And if you were to go up and hit it, your car, so that could be a loss for you. Loss of money to replace, loss of functionality, right, that's the loss. The hazard is the fact that there are cars in the road ahead. It's signaling that there's danger potentially for you up ahead. That's the hazard. And the risk is the probability of loss occurring for an insured or prospect. So that's the probability of you hitting the cars up ahead. I hope that was helpful. And if not, I did my best dog, okay? Okay, that's all I can do. So I hope that was helpful for everyone. You can study those more in the Quizlet on your own. You can look it up. I'm sure there's other videos of other creators that might be able to explain it better than I did, but I hope that helped. All right, moral, mor I'm sorry, morale hazard, E on the end, hazard arising out of an insured's indifference to loss because of the existence of insurance. So morale hazard is, well, I have car insurance. So like, I'm gonna drive buzzed because like I have car insurance. So like, who cares? It's gonna pay out anyway if something happens. That's morale hazard. Don't do that. Loss exposure, any condition or situation that presents a possibility of loss whether or not an actual loss occurs. This literally means every time I get into my car, I am exposing myself to the risk of getting in a car accident because there could be tires up ahead in the road that I can't see. I had to dodge like I think a mattress one time. I had to dodge like a full on um, plastic like organizer bin, like every time I get into my car and I go on the highway or I drive anywhere, that's loss exposure. I'm exposing myself to the potential of a car accident. Every time you are in a boat and you go out on the water, you are exposing yourself to potentially the boat sinking, the boat capsizing, something, right? That's not meant to like scare anyone. It's just like you're, that's loss exposure. You are exposing yourself to the potential of a loss, whether or not there's actually a condition that occurs that would cause that loss at the time. Like, I don't know that every time I get in my car, there's going to be something in the road. That's not a given. I'm just exposing myself to that opportunity when I get behind the wheel. That's loss exposure. We went over risk probability of loss occurring for an insured or a prospect, pure risk, we went over that, a risk that presents the chance of loss, but no opportunity for gain. Pure risks are insurable because insurance companies indemnify you against loss only. An insurance company is not going to indemnify you against a gain. Why would we give you money if you made money, right? Speculative risk is a risk that pre presents a chance of both loss and gain. This is not insurable. This is like gambling. They don't issue insurance for gambling because you could make money. Yes, you could lose money, but you could make money. Not insurable. 
risk retention, being aware of the risks involved, and taking precautions for financial protection. Getting insurance, that's taking precaution for financial protection, right? Risk retention, risk reduction, when the chances of loss are lessened. Example, changing one's lifestyle to minimize a known risk. If you're prone to car accidents, like moi, you might change your lifestyle and be like, I'm gonna work from home. So I don't have to get into a car every day to go to work, right? You might say, I live in a city, so I'm going to take advantage of the public transportation that the city has to offer. Or you might live close enough that you can walk everywhere so you don't get in a car. So that's um, risk reduction, right? You're changing your lifestyle to minimize a known risk. Risk avoidance, when individuals avoid risk entirely. If you never get into a car, you can never be in a car accident. If you never get into the water, you can never get stung by a jellyfish. You can never get eaten by a shark. If you never jump on a trampoline, you can never almost crack a rib like me. Indemnity contract. This is one of the most important terms. Indemnity. Indemnify. Indemnification. If you do not know this term, you are not going to pass this exam. I told this story in one of my other videos when I, I had an agent on my team who took the test, failed it the first time, was super, um, just kind of like down on himself. and was like, I don't, I just like, I don't test well. And I was like, mm -mm, no, you just in school were a fish being judged on how to climb a tree. This is not how you learn. So I'm going to sit with you and we're going to figure out how you learn the right way. Right. So we sat and we we're studying and this word would always come up. And I'm like, you have to know this word. So one day I took a green, like dry erase marker that we had in our office. And I wrote indemnity on his arm. And I was like, now you're never going to forget that term because you're going to be like this crazy chick took a green marker and wrote indemnity on my arm. But like, now I'm not going to forget it. So indemnity is so important because it's basically the definition. It's what I call the definition of insurance, right? It's an agreement by one person for consideration to pay another person a sum of money in the event that the other person sustains a specified loss. Let's break that down. Let's use my ducky. And a coin, which has an eagle on it. Or no, I'm sorry. That's a gecko. This is... Dragon by Gaudi. So we're going to call it a kimono dragon. So my dragon and my ducky. So agreement by one person for consideration, something of value in this case, because it's insurance, it is money, it's premium, right? So agreement by one person for premium to pay another person a sum of money, insurance company, insured, insured, pays insurance company premium, right? Consideration so that the insurance company will pay the insured family, right? The beneficiary, a sum of money in the event that the other person sustains a, spe a specified loss. So this is life insurance, right? Company insured, insured pays company. So that company will pay insured's family if insured passes away. Life insurance brought to you by my ducky and my dragon. Um, it's the same for like car insurance, right? You pay the car insurance company and they pay you out if you get into an accident. So that is indemnification. That's indemnity. That's to indemnify. You are restoring one party to the position that they were in before the loss occurred. One more time for the person taking notes. Restoring one party to the position that they were in before the loss occurred. If you pass away, your family loses your income. I cannot tell y'all how many times I've sat with clients and we're like, 
going through dime and I'm like, what's your debt? What's your income? What's your mortgage? What's your education expenses like for child? How many kids do you have? Basically, we'll plan for the education. Okay, I make $50,000 a year. Okay, great. Based on all of this, you need 1.2 million of insurance. 1.2 million of insurance, but I make $50,000 a year. Right. When you die, so does that $50,000 a year. When you die, your family loses that income. Right? So we're restoring your family to the position that they were in when you were still alive after your passing. That's what life insurance is for. It's what it does. It indemnifies you and your family. Law of large numbers. The larger the number of individual risks combined into a group, the more certainty there is in predicting the degree or amount of loss that will be incurred in any given period. Basically, all that is saying is that the more times an event occurs, the likelier we are to be able to predict the outcome. The more times an event occurs, the likelier we are to be able to predict the outcome. If you're at like a bonfire and you like touch the fire and you're like, ow, that burned my hand. And then you do it again. And you're like, ow, that burned my hand again. And you touch it again. You're like, why is this burning? Okay. So if I touch it a fourth time, it's not going to hurt, right? It's going to hurt. So the more times that something happens and we see what the outcome is, we have a pretty good data set to be able to say, every time I touched the fire before it hurt. So if I do it again, it's probably going to hurt. That's the law of large numbers. Moral hazard, not morale, moral. Moral hazard arises when people behave recklessly because they know they will be saved if things go wrong. Also, maybe like, don't do that. Adhesion. This comes into play, you'll see it on your test. Uh, the question will say like a contract of adhesion. So the contract has been prepared by one party with no negotiation between the applicant and the insurer. The applicant adheres to the terms on a take it or leave it basis. So a contract of adhesion basically just means that your insured puts in an application with the insurance company. And they said, based on what I need, my family needs me to have $1 million of coverage. Based on what my illustration shows, and I'm quoting myself at standard, I should be able to get a million dollars of coverage on a term policy for $55 a month. That's my application. This is what I'm asking you for insurance company. The insurance company will go and underwrite the insured, right, or the applicant, and say, based on that one time when you jumped off of a building and ended up in the hospital five years ago, we are not going to quote you at standard, but we're going to quote you at like a substandard, like rating one, whatever. So we are going to give you that million, but we're going to give it to you for $80 a month. Take it or leave it. The insured, the applicant cannot come back and say, well, you know, my husband's an attorney and he says to never accept the first offer. Does not work like that in insurance. You're going to put in your application and they're going to underwrite and they're going to come back and say accepted or they're going to say accepted, but under different terms, there's no negotiation from there. Once they come back and say, this is what we're offering you, you take it or you leave it. That is what it is. That's a contract of adhesion. Unilateral. Uni in Latin meaning one. Only one party, the insurer, makes any kind of enforceable promise. So why in an insurance application is it unilateral? If like, but I have to pay my premiums to get the insurance. So like, why is that unilateral? It's one enforceable promise, right? So if I, the insured, 
um, apply for life insurance. They come back and say, yeah, you can have it for blah, 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 whatever a month. And then I pay that and then it goes in force. If I'm paying my premiums on time and I pass away, they're legally obligated to perform on that contract that we entered into, right? The company legally has an obligation to the client to pay out their claim. As long as everything was, I can't tell you how many times people are like, well, insurance doesn't pay out. Certain insurances won't pay out if you committed a felony and passed away, like death by suicide, like by cop, they're not going to pay out. If you commit suicide within the first two years, it's not going to pay out. Um, Yeah, there's a bunch of different like reasons why it wouldn't pay out. But if everything is according to the contract, it's enforced, you've been paying your premiums, company legally obligated to hold up their end of the bargain, right? You, as the insured, want life insurance. You're willingly paying for this service. But if you decide to stop paying, the government's not going to knock down your door and be like, excuse me, you entered into this contract and you need to pay for it. It's, you wanted it. Like you're making that decision. So if you just decide to stop paying or you can't pay, no one's going to come back and force you to stay in that contract. But if you're not holding up your end of the bargain, they're let out of their side too. But they're legally required to execute on that contract, basically. Legal purpose. To be valid, the object of the contract and the reason the parties enter into the contract must be legal. My example for this is always a contract to kill. I cannot hire a hitman to come and kill Ducky and pay that hitman, and then that hitman gets cold feet, decides not to kill Ducky, and then I sue hitman because I paid hitman and he won't give me my money back, but he didn't kill Ducky. I can't go to a court of law and say, judge, I paid hitman over here to kill Ducky, and Ducky is sitting over there on the bench, and he's still alive. I want my money back, plus damages for Ducky still being alive. That's not legal. You cannot kill somebody, contract to kill. There's no legal purpose there, so it's not a real contract enforceable by law. Competent parties. Okay, so these are your contract requirements, which like these are kind of all willy-nilly. They're not like in any specific order, so you'll see these come back later in a different term. So in order for a contract to be valid, it must be entered into by competent parties. Now, in order to be competent when it's not humans, the insurer, meaning the insurance company, is competent when it has been licensed and authorized by the state in which it conducts business, um, and it's solvent. So those are your requirements for the company to be considered competent. And then the applicants are considered competent unless they're a minor, unless they're married. They're mentally infirm or they're under the influence of alcohol or narcotics. You can't get somebody drunk that you've been like nurturing for a while and that just be like insurance, right? Like we've been talking about this for seven months and you just like haven't put in your application yet. But like, I literally just saw someone dare you to jump into that pool. And like, what if you died? Like you're drunk, right? Like what if you died? Like we should really go and get you that life insurance policy now. And they go to like enter into it while they're under the influence of alcohol. And then the next day they're like, what are you talking about? I don't want this thing. I don't want to pay for it. It's not a contract, right? Because they were under the influence at the time. So those are your competent parties when it comes to insurance. Must have an, uh, a competent insurance company and must have a competent applicant as well. Offer and acceptance is another one of your contract requirements. To be legally binding, a contract must be made with a definite, unqualified proposal, offer, by one party, and the acceptance of the exact terms by the other. Acceptance. So insurance, insurance company, insured, or applicant, right? So applicant applies, insurance company underwrites, comes back and says, this is your offer. X amount of insurance for X amount of premium a month or a year or a quarter, whatever. 
You accept when you pay your premium. Offer acceptance. Concealment. Failure by the applicant to disclose a known material fact when applying for insurance. Um, concealment just means when you're going through your insurance application and you're answering all your medical questions, if you don't reveal something like any condition that you have or any surgeries that you had in the past five, 10 years, um, any like suicidal thoughts, suicidal tendencies, attempts, um, any diseases, conditions, anything like that, anything that you have or your client have or have had within the time period specified in the application, you have to, have to, have to disclose because if it's in your medical records, they're going to find it anyway. You don't want to have to explain why you concealed. Um, they're not going to fault you. Like you won't get in trouble per se for concealing before the contract goes into effect, if you conceal and somehow they don't find out about it, and then you have some sort of issue come up because of the condition that you conceal that they never found out about, they gave you this insurance policy anyway, based on not knowing that you had a condition that you concealed, that's where those two years, that incontestable period comes in. If they find out about it during that two years, they will rescind the contract. They will not pay off the claim and that would just not be good. So don't conceal. Representation. A statement of fact or opinion made by the insured when applying for insurance, usually in response to a question from the insurer. There's a whole bunch of medical questions when you're going through an application for life insurance. A representation basically is just your answer to the question. I am representing this fact about myself in response to this question from the insurance company. Representation. Insurable interest. A person's right to take out insurance on another person because that person can show he or she would suffer financial loss or hardship in the event of the death of the insured or loss of property. So on your exam, an example of a question dealing with um, insurable interest would be like who of the following um, like pairs does not have insurable interest. And it might be, you know, parent, child, husband, wife, like spouse, spouse, um, what else? Like business partner, business partner, and then business partner, customer. So who of these pairings does not have insurable interest your answer is business owner to business customer because there's no financial loss there right if I own a hat shop and somebody just walks into my store to buy a hat there's no insurable interest there we're strangers if that person dies I don't pay their bills there's no immediate financial hardship for me if that person passes away but if I am married and my husband passes away and I lose his income and let's say I don't work that's a financial hardship for me, right? So there is insurable interest there. If I'm a parent and my child passes away, there's insurable interest there because I have to then pay the um, funeral expenses on the death of my child. Business partner to business partner, there's going to be a loss there because I now have to make up the 50% that my partner was doing. Insurable interest. Broad. When someone knowingly lies to obtain a benefit or advantage to which they are not otherwise entitled, or someone knowingly denies a benefit that is due and to which someone is entitled. I don't really think that this one needs much of an in-depth explanation. It's fraud. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, this is what I was talking about before. Elements of a legally binding contract. There's four of them. Competent parties, consideration, legal purpose, offer, and acceptance. <clears throat> now, one piece of this that I will, um, I want to go a little bit deeper on is the consideration. Because I think we've already been through competent parties. We've already been through consideration, legal purpose, and offer acceptance. We've already gone over all of them. Now, one question that you will have seen in my eight-part series 
about consideration or something like which one of these is not, um, which one of these is not a requirement of a legally binding contract and it's competent parties, equal consideration, legal purpose, offer and acceptance. The answer is equal consideration. So consideration is, as I mentioned before, something of value. It does not always have to be money. Sometimes it can be love and affection. In the case of love and affection, let's say you're buying a house, that's not an equal exchange, right? The house is probably worth a couple hundred thousand to a couple million dollars. You're getting it for love and affection. You're not exchanging equal value there, but you're exchanging something of value. And that person with that million dollar property is saying, that's of enough value to me to give her this thing for a million dollars. In the case of life insurance, the premium that you will pay is going to be much, much less than the amount of money that your family will, will be paid out on that policy if you pass away. I pay on one of my policies $25 a month for $105,000 if I pass away. That's not equal, right? That's not an equal exchange. They didn't break up $105,000 divided by, I think it's like 10 years. So they didn't break up 105,000 divided by however many months is in 10 years. They didn't do that. So it's not equal, but it's still something of value being exchanged. Wanted to go deeper on that. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Allatory, a contract with an element of chance and potential for unequal exchange of value or consideration for both parties. That's an insurance contract. And I just explained why, right? contract with an element of chance for potential for unequal exchange of value or consideration for both parties, the amount that I'm paying to the insurance company for my hundreds of thousands of dollars of insurance, they're not equal, but it's still consideration. So it's still something of value being exchanged. So we call that allatory. Free look provision gives policy owners the right to return the policy for a full premium refund within a specified period of time if they decide not to purchase the insurance. Each state has their own free look period and you need to know yours. Um, here in California, it's like 30 days. Look it up for your own individual state because you likely will be asked that on the exam. I see that come up quite a bit. Policy loan, and then I'm going to pause to get more water because it is at in this house. The policy owner is entitled to borrow an amount equal to the available cash value. If not repaid by the time the insured dies, the loan balance and any interest accrued are deducted from the policy proceeds at the time of the claim. So this is where your clients always ask, well, what if I have a loan out and I pass away? This is why your cash value will never equal your death benefit, right? So um, I have a $250,000 IUL. The cash inside that policy right now is like two grand. I've had it for like two years. If I take a policy loan of a thousand dollars and I pass away and I never pay it back, my loan of a thousand dollars and any interest that I owe on that loan will be deducted from my $250,000 death benefit. That's how that works. All right, grace period, and then I'll pause because we talked about grace period already. A defined amount of time after the premium is due in which a policyholder can make a premium payment without coverage lapsing. Basically, this means if my premium is due on the first of every month and I accidentally didn't pay, I have X amount of days or months to make up that premium payment that I wasn't able to pay before the company will lapse my policy. That is your grace period. Okay, I will be right back. Oh, wait. And I thought I was pausing recording. Okay, guys, I took a little avocado break, so. Uh, grace period, we talked about, so moving on to consideration clause, which I briefly mentioned earlier, states that the policy owner's consideration consists of completing the application and paying the initial premium. 
um, contestable period. The incontestable clause allows an insurer to contest a claim during the contestable period, which is usually within the first two years of the policy's life. I've mentioned that quite a bit <clears throat> um, in this video and in some of my other videos, but yeah, the um, basic premise of your incontestable clause during the contestable period is if you conceal a condition and the company finds out about it after you've passed away or if you have living benefits, you put in like a living benefit claim for a condition that you had that was existing at the time of application and you didn't disclose and they find out about it, that it existed at that time, um, they can rescind the contract because at this point they are the injured party because you basically committed fraud against them. I will state after this two-year period is up though, this incontestable or the contestable period <clears throat> after it's up, they can't rescind the contract anymore. If they don't find it within those first two years, they don't find it. That's it. Incontestable clause states that the insurer can no longer contest the validity of the policy after it has been enforced for a specified period of time, typically two years. Wow, I'm like psychic. Suicide provision protects the insurer, the insurance company, against the purchase of a policy in contemplation of suicide. The suicide period is typically within the first two years of the policy's inception. Um, yeah, don't get a life insurance policy for contemplating suicide. Misstatement of age. This clause protects the insurance company against an applicant who lies about their age. The insurance company has the right to adjust your face amount up or down to coincide with the face amount or policy limit the correct premium would have purchased if you had not lied about your age. So there's not necessarily like a penalty aside from we're just going to adjust it to what it would have been if we'd gotten it right the first time. Accelerated benefits provision provides for the early payment of some portion of the policy's face amount should the insured suffer from a terminal critical or chronic illness or critical injury. The remaining portion of the policy is payable as a death benefit. So these are those living benefits that I was talking about. They're called um, ABRs, accelerated benefit, accelerated benefit riders. Um, it allows some portion of your death benefit to pay out in the event that you have a terminal critical or chronic illness or critical injury. I um, have never really like told my story in any of these videos, but uh, the abridged version is I was in a pretty bad car accident, hit by a drunk driver. There was a death in that accident. And there was no life insurance in place. So not only was there no life insurance for the gentleman that passed away to take care of his family, there was no, I didn't have life insurance. I didn't have living benefits. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced receiving a $45,000 bill at the age of 22. That's why I got into life insurance. Living benefits are extremely important. That's my TED talk. Non-forfeiture options. Okay, I had to write these down because these have always been like my least favorite thing to talk about. And when people are like, what does that mean? Go deeper. I'm like, no, can't. So I did a little bit of research so I could go a little bit deeper for you guys. So there's three non-forfeiture options. They are cash surrender, reduce paid up, and extended term. So essentially what non-forfeiture options are, they allow the policyholder to receive a benefit or value from the policy if they choose to surrender or terminate the policy before its maturity or if they are unable to pay the premiums. So essentially what these do, what these non-forfeiture options do is say, okay, you can't afford to keep the policy, but we want to ensure that there's some value that you receive from it. So there are options of what you can do to basically like receive that value. So cash surrender, you can take the um, amount of uh, the surrender 
the surrender value. There we go. You can take the surrender value and get that back. So you get a little bit of your money back. And then reduce paid up option, you can um, reduce paid up is they will reduce the amount of coverage, right? The amount of death benefit that you have to reflect the amount of money that you've already paid. So let's say you had a $300,000 face amount and you had, these are whole life policies. So, you know, you have a whole life policy, you've paid it for 10 years and you no longer can keep it. You can't afford it, whatever. They can give you a reduce paid. Uh, they'll reduce your face amount for the amount that you've paid into it. So let's say um, after 10 years, the amount that you've paid into it warrants a $70,000 face amount. They'll do that and say, okay, we're reducing your face amount, but now it's paid up because we're just going to say, you've paid this much into it. This is what you've got now. And then extended term, I had to look up as well. Whole life policy, use cash value to purchase a term policy with death benefit equal to the original whole life policy. So that's an extended term option. So those are your non-forfeiture options. Like I said, they're my least favorite thing to talk about, but essentially it's just a way for you to get value out of your policy if you can't continue to pay for it. Absolute assignment, a transfer by the policy holder of all control and rights to a third party. It is absolute and irrevocable. Absolute assignment, we cannot take this back. Payer provision. Okay, so this is typically a rider that's attached to juvenile insurance policies. It provides that in the event of death or disability of the adult paying the premium for the child's policy, the premiums will be waived until the insured child reaches a specified age or until the maturity date of the contract, whichever comes first. So say Ducky is my child and I am paying for a life insurance policy for my child here, Ducky, and I uh, become disabled and I can no longer work. So essentially I can no longer afford the premiums. The, the payer provision provides that I no longer owe the premiums, but the policy stays in force on my child until the child reaches a specified age. And I'm not positive if they take over the premiums themselves or if they just never have to pay them again, I'm not sure, but I'm assuming it means when they reach that specified age, they take the premiums over again or the maturity date of the contract. But that's what the payer provision does. It says there's an event that this adult now can no longer pay for the premiums for this child policy. We don't want the child not to be covered. The premium payments are now waived. So that's the payer provision. Waiver of premium. This is why I want, I want to do these together. So waiver of premium rider is for you, yourself. So payer is I'm paying on the child's policy. Waiver of premium is me, myself, my own policy. Prevents a policy from lapsing for non-payment of premiums while the insured is disabled and unable to work. The policy owner is relieved of paying premiums for as long as the disability continues. So that is a lot of times I would find people would get confused or mix those two up. Waiver of premium, me, myself, I'm disabled. Payer provision, I'm disabled or I die. And the premiums are waived on my child's policy that I was the payer of, I was paying for. Okay, policy dividends. We've briefly talked about these. Policy dividends are paid out by participating companies only not non-participating policies, pretty self-explanatory. If fewer insureds have died than was estimated, a surplus results and the company can return to the policy owners a part of the premiums paid. That's why I was saying we have a $100 million um, amount that we make, but only $90 million had to be paid out in liabilities. So we have this surplus of $10 million. Fewer insureds die, the surplus results, the company returns to the policy owners a part of those premiums paid. That's why I said, they're not taxable. See, the next one, policy dividends are a return of part of premiums already paid and as such are not taxable income. 
ปิด Return of premium rider provides that in the event of the death of the insured within a specified period of time, the policy will pay in addition to the face amount an amount equal to the sum of all premiums paid to date. Pretty self-explanatory. You pass away pretty early into having your policy, they'll pay out the face amount, but they'll also return your premiums. That's a rider that you can choose. We went over waiver of premium and then extended term option. Okay, cool. So I wanted to like define them before here they're defined again. So extended term non-forfeiture option, use the policy's cash value to purchase a term insurance policy in an amount equal to the original policy's face value for as long a period as the cash value will purchase. That is your extended term option. Cash surrender options, another non-forfeiture option. Policy owners may request an immediate cash payment of their cash values when their policies are surrendered. That's your surrender value. Insuring clause. I don't think this is another non-forfeiture. Yeah. Insuring clause. A general statement that identifies the basic agreement made by the insurance company to pay benefits upon the insured's death, usually located on the first page of the policy. It's just a clause stating it's insurance and like basically what insurance does, right? General statement identifies basic agreement made to pay benefits upon the insured's death. Pretty self-explanatory. Policy owner, policy holder, that's the person that owns and will pay the premiums. The person who has the right to exercise the privileges and rights in the policy contract. So the policy owner is not always necessarily the insured. So just keep that in mind. While for myself, I own my policies and I'm the insured, I could, when I have children one day, purchase a policy on my kids. I'd be the policy owner, but I wouldn't be the insured. The policy owner is the person that owns the policy, pays the policy, and has the rights to exercise the privileges and the rights within the policy contract. Not the insured, but the owner. Owner's right provision defines the person who may name and change beneficiaries, select options available under the policy, and receive any financial benefits from the policy. So that's basically an extension of this one, right? The person that has the right to exercise the privileges. So that would be like change beneficiaries, select options. So maybe like add or subtract riders onto the policy um, and receive any financial benefits. Of course, that would go back to like being able to change beneficiaries. Automatic premium loan provision. Um, typically anything that you see like the word provision on would qualify as like a rider to your policy. So automatic premium, what's my automatic premium loan provision authorizes insurer company to automatically pay any premium in default at the end of the grace period and charge the amount against the life insurance policy as a policy loan. So as you are paying into your whole life policy or your universal life policy, anything cash value, um, Obviously, there's cash being stashed inside that policy. If you have unstable income or you fall on hard times and there's cash inside that policy and you're like, I really could use a month where I don't have to pay for this thing, you can, like, if you don't pay, they can pull it from the cash value. So it's an automatic premium loan from your policy's cash value to keep the policy from lapsing. And it can do this until you run out of cash. Most common types of policy exclusions. War. This is often referred to as the results clause. Um, I have like touched on this, I think, briefly in some of my past videos. War being an exclusion to what life insurance policies will pay out for is why the military has that $400,000 like SGLI policy on all of our servicemen and women. Private aviation. Yeah, that's a rough one. If you are somebody who flies private, 
Um, yeah, typically that is considered to be more dangerous than flying commercial. And if you're in that plane crash, sometimes it will not pay out. It's policy exclusion, commission of a felony. Like I said before, if you like death by suicide by cop, like they're not going to pay out hazardous occupation or hobbies, suicide within the first two years. So sometimes being in this industry, as I mentioned previously, people will not necessarily believe in what we do because they say, oh, I had someone who their policy didn't pay out. It's probably one of these reasons and they just weren't informed of that. Or it's something like, oh my goodness, we have someone who the company that they were at before they joined the insurance industry had um, an employee catch COVID during the COVID times pass away and they did not pay out because it was not a private policy. It was a group policy. And this group policy stated that they would only pay due to death from something caused within the work place. And they said that they could not prove that that person got COVID from being at work. So they wouldn't pay out. So that's like one piece of advice that I can give to you if you're going to be in this industry is do your best to educate. Don't talk at, but you will find the naysayers that have experiences like this or have family members or friends that have had stories like this. You're more educated now understanding that some of these private policies have exclusions and likely if a policy didn't pay out, it's for one of two reasons. One, they fell under one of these exclusions or two, it was a group policy. It was a work policy, which are not the same as individual policies. They have much more exclusions than individual policies do. And likely they didn't die from an accident at work. And they couldn't prove that they died from an illness that they got at work. My team lead, his father passed away when he was 12 from a heart attack peacefully at home. They had a four bedroom house, four kids. He made really good money. We lived here in San Diego and like a million dollar house in the 80s, which is like bananas. Whereas now it's like, this is my garage, $1 million, right? Um, but back then it actually like meant something. And they ended up losing the house because his father's work policy didn't pay out because he died of a heart attack at home. So yeah, educate yourselves on why some of these policies won't pay out. That way you can go and educate the people that you are close to and that you care about on the benefits of life insurance and if they have one of the, those horror stories where oh they paid into it and it didn't pay out it's it's probably one of the reasons that are mentioned here or one of the reasons that I mentioned from a work policy perspective non forfeiture option definition we talked about this before it allows the policy owner to stop paying premiums and not forfeit any of the equity in the policy by giving them those options on hey you know, you've paid into it, you want to surrender the policy, you don't want to give up the value, here are your options. Policy dividend options, five types. Okay, so this is if you have a participating policy and you there's that divisible surplus, so you get your share, so you get your dividends. These are the types in which you can choose to take those dividends. Cash dividend option, accumulation at interest option, paid up additions option, reduced premium option, or one-year term option. I'm trying to figure out if I should like go a little bit deeper on those. Um, cash dividend option, obviously, like in my previous example from earlier in the video where I said, oh, let's say, you know, your share of the divisible surplus is 50 bucks. You can take your 50 bucks. Accumulation of interest, I don't know how to explain that one. I do apologize. Paid up additions, high insurance company, how can I, or how much more insurance will this $50 buy me? Tack it on, uh, reduce premium option. Hey, insurance company, I usually owe you $350 a year. Now I want to give you this 50 back and owe only $300 for this year because of my dividend that paid out. And then one year term option, I don't necessarily know how to um, like describe that one to you guys. And I don't want to guess. 
because I don't want to steer you in the wrong direction. So I can't explain accumulation of interest or one year term. Look those up. I do apologize. Guaranteed insurability rider. This permits insured, right? Insured to buy specific amounts of additional insurance at specified intervals without evidence of insurability. So this allows you to buy more insurance at specified intervals. So they can say, you know, after your 10 year term expires, like, do you want to buy more without having to um, prove insurability again? Basically you don't have to re underwrite is what this is saying. You have the ability to purchase more insurance at specific times without having to medically underwrite um, answer those medical questions, prove insurability. It's pretty cool. Accidental death rider doubles the face amount of life insurance if death occurs as a result of an accident. The death must occur within a specified time after the date of accident, which is usually about 90 days. So what that means is if you choose to have this accidental death rider, um, and I die as a result of an accident, like a car accident, we'll say, and I have a $250,000 policy, it will pay out $500,000. So what that piece in the parentheses means is, let's say I got into a car accident and I'm in a coma, but I haven't passed away. Let's say my coma lasts for six months, but this accidental death rider will only pay out that double face amount if I pass away like from my coma within the, those first 90 days. So if it takes me longer, like if I do die from that accident, but it's longer than 90 days later, they won't double the face amount. <laughs> so die quickly. Just kidding. Beneficiary. The party designated to receive the policy's proceeds upon the insured's death. Pretty self-explanatory. Mortality factor. A measure of the number of deaths in a given population. Insurance companies use mortality tables to help predict the life expectancy and probability of death for a given group. So these like mortality factors are how, right, the company's help predict the life expectancy and probability of death for a given group. This is why men, your insurance is going to be more expensive than us women. So if you take me and I have a twin brother and we're both same health, he's still going to be more expensive than me, even though we have the same health history, we're the same age, yada, yada, just because he's a man, he's going to have to pay more due to these factors, like these mortality tables Typically, men will pass away sooner than women. So that's how they calculate, like, when do we think you're going to die? How much do we, like, how, if you get it at this age, how long do we think you're going to be paying in before you're likely to die based on the average? That's how they calculate premiums. Interest factor. When policy owners pay premiums to a life insurance company, the funds do not sit idle in the insurer's vaults. They're combined with other funds and invested to earn interest. Interest is one of the ways that an insurance company can lower premium rates because they're making money, right? So that's your interest factor. So it's not sitting in a savings account earning 0.00001% like our money is in a bank. They're investing it so that they can make more money. Again, because these insurance companies have to pay out lots and lots of money. They have to be solvent. They have to learn how to make as much money as possible. And this is the way that they do it. All right, last one for tonight. Oh, factors that impact premium amounts, the five types. Age, gender, health, occupation, and hobbies. Basically just goes back to what I just said. Those mortality tables, they'll say, okay, um, like based on your age, your gender, health, what you do for work, high stress, low stress, hazardous job, not hazardous job, hazardous hobbies, not hazardous hobbies, we're going to be able to determine how much we're going to charge you because we're trying to determine how long we think you'll be able to pay into this policy. If you're in poor health, go skydiving every weekend or like a scuba instructor and are 70 years old, 
you go with Bella, I'm with Bella. So that's it. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Um, like I said, it took me kind of a long time to film this video and the second one that will come just because I was like, it's been a long time since I've really like gone deep into these um, terms. So I wanted to make sure that this was going to be of value and that I could even elaborate on anything that I thought needed elaborating on. If you guys have questions, please put it down in the comments. Please share this video with anyone else on your team, in your company, in your family that is also getting their license. I hope my page helps you guys pass the first time and I will see you in part two. Bye now.